Welcome to this special Visions and Voices event, the second presentation of our Provost Writers Series. I'm Beth Garrett, I'm the Provost, and I'm really pleased to be the host of these four events this, this uh, year. This series highlights the enormous talents of our USC faculty authors, and it provides an opportunity for students to engage with them personally as the writers read their work, discuss their creative process, and reflect on their own stories. Our first presentation by our colleague David Troyer from his latest book, Res Life, was an unqualified success. And tonight we will have a reading by Stephen Ross from his new work, Hollywood Left and Right, How Movie Stars Shaped American Politics, published by Oxford University Press in 2011. Steve Ross, a professor of history and chairman of the history department at USC Dornsife, and past chairman of the history department at USC Dornsife, was the first, family, first person in his family to go to college. He received his BA from Columbia University, a Bachelor of Philosophy from Oxford University, and a PhD from Princeton University. He has written extensively on the history of labor, film, and social politics. His first book, Workers on the Edge, Work, Leisure, and Politics in Industrializing Cincinnati, was adapted into an educational video by Cincinnati unions entitled, They Build the City, the Working People of Cincinnati. His second book, Working Class Hollywood, Silent Film and the Shaking, Shaping of Class in America, received the prestigious Theater Library Association Book Award in 1999. It was also named by the Los Angeles Times as one of the best books for 1998, and it was nominated for a Pulitzer and a National Book Award in history. His latest book, from which he will be reading tonight, Hollywood Left and Right, received a Pulitzer Prize nomination and a Film Scholars Award from the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts, and Sciences, the academic equivalent of an Oscar. Hmm. In this work, Steve argues that the popular belief that all movie stars are of a liberal stripe conceals the significant impact of conservative Hollywood moguls and actors on the American political process in the 20th century. Although such stars as Harry Belafonte and Jane Fonda have been highly visible in their support for political causes on the left, the activism of Ronald Reagan and Louis B. Mayer have had more lasting effects, he writes, on the compelling story of American triumphalism. I'm not sure, Steve, that I was completely convinced that the right's success relative to the more numerous Hollywood left is due to the reality that it is, quote, easier to preserve the status quo than to inaugurate dramatic change. While the observation about inertia and the power of the status quo is indis indisputably true, it seems to me that the modern right, typified by Reagan, has worked sometimes successfully to transform the established order to accord with their own vision of government. Well, as you can see, we're going to have quite a discussion tonight about some of the provocative ideas that Steve writes about in his book, and I look forward to it. I am particularly excited about the conversation that we'll have after Steve talks about his book, his creative process, his approach. Joining Steve tonight for the discussion of these topics is Martin Kaplan, the Norman Lehrer Professor of Entertainment, Media, and Society at the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. Marty has served as Chief Speechwriter to Vice President Walter Mondale, Deputy Campaign Manager for Mondale's 1984 bid for the presidency, and is Executive Assistant to USC Commissioner of Education Ernest Boyer. He worked at Walt Disney Studios for 12 years, both as vice president of production for live action feature films and as a writer producer under exclusive contract. He was associate dean of USC Annenberg School for 10 years and is the founding director of the school's Norman Lear Center, whose mission is to study and shape the impact of media and entertainment on society. You can see why Marty and Steve are such perfect complements to each other given their scholarly interest. As Steve writes in his book, Politics and democracy is a participatory activity, not just a spectator sport. It's one of my favorite lines of the book, and I think what we'll have tonight is the same sort of interchange between our two professors. I hope you enjoy the second installment of the Provost Writer Series. Next semester, we'll have two more. Professor Deborah Harkness, a New York Times bestselling author and the creator of the All Souls Trilogy, and Professor Carol Muskie Dukes, the former Poet Laureate of California. Please do attend all these and as many Visions and Voices events as you can. But for tonight, let's enjoy these terrific professors and our great author, Stephen Ross. Thank you.
I would uh, simply say, allegedly, great author. <laughs> um, a few things before I start. One, I like to talk. And we're under uh, guidelines. So I'm actually going to set, I discovered I can use my iPhone as a timer. So I'm going to set it for 27 minutes, which gives me three minutes to wrap up if I'm going too long. Uh, the other thing is I'm not going to read from my book. I find that actually boring. Instead, what I'd like to do is uh, the university equivalent of show and tell. Show you some images and talk about some themes. Uh, <clears throat> I began this book concerned about the fate of democracy uh, and its constant erosion across the 20th and 21st centuries. What does it say about our nation when 50% of the eligible voters don't participate in the most important decision we make every four years. And I wondered how could a historian make a modest contribution to reviving democracy? Well, the League of Women Voters, who have done the best surveys of who votes and who doesn't vote, have identified the main people of the 50% who don't vote are women. And when they're asked why they don't vote, they say it's because they don't really understand the issues. And so my idea was in order to get people to understand politics across a century in a appealing and engaging fashion. Why not write about movie stars and through their story tell the story of American politics? And indeed the press has um, almost always trivialized Hollywood politics by ignoring the serious in favor of the salacious. And yet for over a hundred years movie stars have influenced the way we've thought about politics. From Charlie Chaplin to Arnold Schwarzenegger, Hollywood activists have spoken out on the most important issues of the day. And as Marlon Brando told reporters in Washington in 1963 at the March on Washington, if an actor can be influential selling deodorant, he can be just as useful selling ideas. Well, conventional wisdom argues that Hollywood has always been the bastion of the left. And I would argue conventional wisdom is wrong on two points. First, conservatives have a longer history in Hollywood than liberals. And second, and something our Provost Garrett alluded to, even though the Hollywood left has been more numerous and visible, the Hollywood right has had a greater impact on American politics. Now, you might well ask, how is that possible? Could he have just made that up? How can you say that? And I would say that, to, that if you look at American politics writ large in the 20th century, there have been two foundational moments. The first happened under the presidency of Franklin Roosevelt, the creation of a welfare state. And the second happened or began in 1980 under the presidency of a former actor, Ronald Reagan, who attempted to dismantle the welfare state. And indeed, the conservative revolution of the 1980s, as I discovered in the course of doing my work, could not have happened without the foundation laid by Louis B. Mayer, his protege, George Murphy, Murphy's protege, Ronald, uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, and then further on, Charlton Heston to a lesser extent. Well, today I'd like to offer you several ways to think about the relationship between movie stars and politics. And indeed, movie star activism on both sides have been far more complex, deeper, and longer than most of us think. So today, again, rather than read anything, what I want to do is give you a kind of synopsis of six different types of political activism. Visual politics, electoral politics, issue-oriented politics, movement politics, image politics, and celebrity politics. Now, movie star, uh, uh, wrong one. Uh, do we have any technically, technologically savvy people? Because this is, uh, here we go. This is still not working well. Here we go, thank you. Movie star activism began with visual politics in which stars like Charlie Chaplin used film to communicate political ideas directly to millions of Americans. 
and a childhood of uh, poverty and humiliation turned him into what I call an instinctual radical. That is someone who instinctually favored the poor over the rich, humane socialism over harsh capitalism, labor over capital. And given, given his early background and given the fact that a majority of early urban audiences were working class and immigrants, it's hardly surprising that Chaplin uh, mocked authority figures that gave working people the hardest time. Police, judges, employers, and even world leaders like Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini. Now, because he could do this, because he had complete control over his films, Chaplin was his own director, editor, star, writer, uh, and later producer and later distributor. Consequently, there was no studio head to tell him what he could or couldn't do. And Chaplin was somebody who would never liked to join any organization, said that any time he had to give a speech, which was rare, he threw up beforehand. Here's the most famous man in the world at his time, and he is profoundly shy, but he's not shy on the screen. And that's why I say visual politics, he can put it directly on the screen where it could both be seen and potentially acted on by millions of people. Well, although his early films focused on domestic issues, Chaplin soon discovered there was a cost for being too far in front of public opinion. And during World War I, although he considered himself a pacifist, he went out and cooperated with the government's war bond campaign, where the government used celebrities like Chaplin, Douglas Fairbanks, and Mary, Mary Pickford to sell war bonds. But World War II proved a very different matter. Uh, here he is selling them on Wall Street. It was only after Chaplin began speaking out in his film, The Great Dictator, and then off the screen in various Soviet American friendship dinners that audiences stopped listening to him. And Chaplin discovered something that held true for the rest of the century, and especially during wartime. If you spoke out, or made films that supported a conservative patriotic agenda, you were likely to be hailed as a hero, but if you criticized the government, especially from a left point of view, you would earn the wrath and hatred of millions of Americans. Well, Hollywood's move towards electoral politics came in the 1920s, and surprisingly, it came from the right and not from the left. It was MGM head Louis B. Mayer who cemented the first formal ties between a studio and a political party. It was Mayer who brought the Republican Party to Hollywood and Hollywood to the Republican Party. And during the 1920s, he turned MGM into a publicity wing for the GOP. And Mayer was the first um, mogul to use movie stars to enhance the image of politicians. He would find out whenever a prominent Republican politician or world figure was coming through Los Angeles, Mayer would find out who their favorite movie star was and then invite them onto the lot. He would build a dais where he would hold a special lunch. He would have one star on the left usually, another star on the right. And here we see President Coolidge with his favorite star, Mary Pickford. More to the point, Chap Chap uh, Mayer made sure that he had his studio photographers there to take a picture of the, mo of the movie stars surrounding the politician those pictures then went out on the wire services the next day and gave that Republican a patina of glamour that any Democratic rival lacked. Well, Mayer was also a power broker at the state and national levels. He was a delegate to several GOP conventions, and his key moment came in 1928 when he arranged a secret meeting between disgruntled Democrat William Randolph Hearst and his good friend Herbert Hoover. Hoover was clearly going to win, but he didn't have enough votes on the first ballot. They met at um, Mayor's Beach House in Santa Monica. They struck a deal, and Hearst agreed to throw his support and his delegates behind Mayor, uh, behind, excuse me, behind uh, Hoover. It was enough to get him elected on the first ballot. In return, Mayor became the first Hollywood mogul, the first Hollywood figure to spend a night at the White House. And he remarked at one point, I can't believe it, a Jewish boy from Russia here spending a night 
at the White House. But his daughter gave a different view. She said, my father complained all night that the gravy was too thick. <laughs> but Mayer was also a producer of political visions. In MGM films of the 1930s and 40s, and especially the Hardy Family series, which is to this day the most successful series in MGM history, helped foster a conservative ideology by promoting a cinematic politics that identified America with capitalism, optimism, mobility, and hope. And this would be a cinematic politics that Ronald Reagan would later codify into his It's Morning in America speech. Well, it was during the 1930s that Hollywood as a whole became politicized. And they became politicized around the election of Franklin Roosevelt and opposition to the spread of fascism and Nazism across Europe. And indeed, many stars like Edward G. Robinson, better known as Little Caesar, engaged in what soon became the dominant form of Hollywood politics, and that is what I call issue-oriented politics. Robinson showed how a mobilized community of stars could use their celebrity to draw national attention to the most controversial issues of the day, and in so doing, help sway public opinion. And they did this by organizing groups such as the Hollywood Anti-Nazi League that attracted worldwide attention by sponsoring marches and very cleverly made sure that all the movie star representatives were at the front of the march. Uh, they organized weekly radio shows, and they published their own newspapers. Now, Robinson's personal politics may best be described as left liberal. That is, he was not a radical trying to overthrow or restructure capitalism. Rather, he was militantly devoted to the Bill of Rights and the cause of equal justice for all people under the law, regardless of race, ethnicity, religion, or politics. And in addition to participating in a wide range of progressive causes, Robinson also starred in Confessions of a Nazi Spy, which came out in the spring of 1939. This was the first American film to explicitly deal with the threats Hitler's Germany posed to the United States. Now, although Robinson and other issue-oriented activists believed they were fighting a just cause, their repeated international pronouncements that were far in advance of public opinion came to haunt them in the post-war years as the House Un-American Activities Committee began its pattern of portraying anti-fascists as the allies of communists bent on destroying America. And Robinson's career as a major spy came to an end in 1950 when he was accused, never proved, accused of being a communist. And one of the things I argue in my book is that Robinson's downfall caused a greater um, chill through Hollywood than the incarceration of the more famous Hollywood 10. And that's because everyone in Hollywood knew that the members of the Hollywood 10 were or had been communists. And it wasn't as though they thought it was OK for the government to go after communists, but they understood why that was the case. But when the government went after left liberals, when the government went after the man who is considered both the softest touch in Hollywood and Hollywood's leading intellectual, a man who spoke six languages, a man who had the greatest privately owned collection of Impressionist art in the United States, that is when they really got scared. And as Lauren Bacall wrote, uh, a whole generation of activists took note of Robinson's fate and relinquished their political opinions or at least stop voicing them in order to protect their families, their jobs, and their lives. Well, George Murphy and Ronald Reagan opened the doors for a fourth kind of activism, what I call movement politics. And movement politics is neither left nor right. Rather, it's dominated and characterized by diverse groups of individuals who share a common determination to bring radical changes to the nation's political, social, and economic systems. And for Murphy, Reagan, and the millions of people who voted for them, the goal was not simply to win an election. The goal was to alter the very foundations of American government by overturning the most important liberal achievement of the 20th century, the New Deal state. 
And these two former actors were new kinds of politicians for a new media age. They understood that in the age of television, a candidate's image was more important than his or her ideas. And hardcore conservatives admired Barry Goldwater, but his prickly personality and his image as a man who might start a nuclear war simply frightened millions of voters. In 1964, when Murphy ran for Senate, and in 66, when Reagan ran for governor, they accomplished what Goldwater could not. They figured out how to sell conservatism to a wide range of previously skeptical voters, including blue-collar Democrats. And by making conservatism palatable, they made the conservative revolution possible. Well, most Americans know about Reagan's rise to power, but what they don't know is that everything Reagan did, Murphy did first. Murphy was the trailblazer who understood the importance of media and celebrity long before Reagan did. But Reagan would copy his friend and do it much better. Both men were far more politically savvy than they've been given credit for. They began their activism in the 40s and the 50s by speaking to grassroots conservative groups around the country and articulating an ideological agenda that called for dismantling the New Deal, returning power to state and local governments, reducing taxes, and waging war against all foes of American security. And by the early 1960s, both men were preaching a message of fear and reassurance. And I would argue, in fact, that this has been the Republican mantra since the end of World War II. Fear of communism and creeping socialism within the government and reassurance that conservatives could save the nation by defeating the Soviet Union and overturning the New Deal. Well, Murphy's election in 1964 and Reagan's election in 66 demonstrated how a candidate's image and ability to communicate proved of far greater importance to voters than his or her ideas. And I show this here because in the 1964 campaign, one of the democratically owned television stations thought that they could undermine his candidacy by showing his movies on late night television and that having him dance with Shirley Temple here would in fact demean the image. Is this the man you want to be senator? And it had the exact opposite impact. He said in his autobiography, tons of women came up to me and said, oh, you were so cute dancing with Shirley Temple and it was so lovely. You're such a nice man and you always played lovely roles and I'm going to vote for you. And he would then use this, as more and more people said it to him, he would, in a stump speech, say, you know, I've been in more of your bedrooms than any candidate in American history. Well, as the worst exit, oh yes, and here's how um, Time looked at the election. Pierre Salinger, former press secretary for John Kennedy, seen very statesmanlike. And what is, what is Murphy? He's the Irish leprechaun. Murphy pulled the biggest upset of the 1964 election. He was the only Republican non-incumbent to win high office. Well, as the worst excesses of the Red Scare died down, Hollywood leftists became increasingly involved in radical movement politics. And from the 1950s to the 1980s, Harry Belafonte and Jane Fonda, though acting independently of one another, built coalitions that attacked racism, fought for civil rights, opposed the war in Vietnam, and launched grassroots movements aimed at limiting the power of government and corporations. And today we tend to think of Sidney Poitier as the great African-American star of the 50s and 60s. But Belafonte was the far bigger celebrity. In 1957, his Banana Boat song album, that's the Deo song, sold more records than either Frank Sinatra or Elvis Presley. Uh, but Belafonte was a highly political man. And like his mentor, Paul Robeson, he used his celebrity to further a radical political agenda. And Belafonte was particularly taken with the potential power of Hollywood. He believed that if Americans could see change on the screen, if they could see how it worked, then they could envision it happening in their own lives. 
And since most studios proved too timid to deal with race, in 1957, he became the first post-war African American to launch his own production company and to fund his own films. He made Odds Against Tomorrow and The World of Flesh and the Devil in 1959. But despite the fact that he funded it, he still had to deal with distributors and he found he still had to censor his films because 20% of the box office came from the South and the South did not want a film where a black man touched a white woman, period. Well, frustrated with Hollywood opposition, he quit the movie business in 1959, and for the next nine years, he served as one of Martin Luther King's two key advisors, one of his two best friends, and as the single biggest donor to the civil rights movement. Equally important, Bel uh, Belafonte served as King's go-between with a number of key political groups and figures. And if you look at the history of the civil rights movement, Harry Belafonte is the only man trusted by all the wings, from SNCC to CORE to the Panthers to the, S to the Southern Christian Leadership uh, Committee. And by the mid-60s, the radical activist also pushed King to include opposition to the Vietnam War and American imperialism as part of the movement's struggle for justice. But after King's assassination in 1968, the focus of the left turned to Vietnam, and Jane Fonda emerged as the most visible and vilified activist of her time. And after living in France for many years, Fonda returned to the United States in 1970 and immediately involved herself in every major political movement, but focused her attention mainly on the anti-war movement. And Fonda went a step further than any of the other movement activists because she didn't simply join ongoing movements. She and her husband, Tom Hayden, created two grassroots radical organizations. In 1972, they founded the Indochina Peace Committee to oppose Nixon, President Nixon's escalation of the war in Laos and Cambodia. And in 1976, with the war over, the couple founded the Committee for Economic Democracy, an organization that mobilized Americans around opposition to imperialism and challenging corporate dominance over government and the economy. She also did something that nobody else did. A number of movie stars founded their own production companies, but found, Fonda founded a production company that made films specifically to dramatize the issue on the screen that CED was doing on the streets. She made uh, Coming Home in 1978 to deal with uh, treatment of veterans. She made The China Syndrome in 1979 to deal with nuclear power, 9 to 5 to deal with women's, working women's rights, and the very bad but interesting political movie, Rollover, dealing with the power of oil magnates and American bankers cooperating with them. Now, Fonda's legacy was the most controversial of any movie star, largely because of her 1972 visit to Hanoi, in which she was photographed sitting in that Viet Cong aircraft gun. And she went to Vietnam to publicize American bombings, illegal bombings of the country's dike system. But the public never remembered this. They only remember that image of her sitting in the enemy anti-aircraft gun. And she told me when I interviewed her, she said, I said, how'd you do this? I mean, I've read all this stuff. But how, how? She said, well, they were being such nice hosts. They were taking me everywhere around Vietnam. We went there and they said, oh, just sit down. Let's put on a helmet. And she said, you know, I want to be a good guest. And I did. She said, the moment I did it, I realized, wait a minute, I'm sitting in an anti-aircraft gun that's shooting down American planes. And she turned to the photographers and said, could I please have your film? Please pull it out of your camera. And they said, no, 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 don't worry. This is just for our archives. Nobody will ever see it. The next day, that picture was in every major newspaper throughout the world. And like Chaplin and Robinson, she discovered that stars that spoke out in advance of public opinion were accused of being non-patriotic at best and traitors at worst. As columnist Ellen Goodman wrote, we give medals to stars on the right and FBI dossiers to stars on the left. Well, while Fonda was the most hated Hollywood leftist of the 70s and 80s, Charlton Heston was the most reviled conservative of the 80s and 90s. And ironically, both were linked in the public imagination 
by an iconic set of images. In this case, Heston as Moses. Now, Heston's ability to use his cinematic persona to further controversial causes signaled the rise of yet another kind of politics, what I call image politics. That is, where a star's screen image and persona is so strong and so credible and so powerful that Americans will play, pay close attention to anything they have to say. And there haven't been many. When I think of, you know, on the right, I'm thinking of John Wayne, who the Republicans asked to be their presidential candidate in 1948. I think of Jimmy Stewart. And on the left, I think of Gregory Peck. I think of Sidney Poitier. And today, I, I think the closest on the left is someone like George Clooney. In Heston's case, his role as Moses and later as Ben-Hur in Judah, um, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, later as John the Baptist, created a biblical aura that legitimized him and his politics. And few Americans remember that Heston was the first major star to march on behalf of civil rights. He used his Moses image first on the left. And in 1961, May 61, he traveled to Oklahoma City to join a march calling for the integration of local restaurants. And two years later, he cemented his public image as Moses by leading the Hollywood contingent participating in the march on Washington. But in 1972, disenchanted with what he saw as the radical agenda of the Democratic Party, and as he would write, I never left the Democratic Party, they left me. He became a leading member of Democrats for Nixon, and over the next 30 years, he emerged as a key spokesperson for a variety of conservative causes. In the late 1990s, he served as the NRA's most visible spokesperson. And indeed, his political impact proved especially crucial in the 2000 presidential election when he campaigned excuse me, in several gun-heavy swing states and repeatedly drew larger crowds than either George Bush or Al Gore. In pundits credit, gun owners in West Virginia, where Democrats outnumbered Republicans two to one, and where Heston spent the greatest amount of his time with tipping the state and therefore the presidential election to George Bush. And I just want to show Heston used the Moses image throughout his political career. Uh-oh, I'm taking longer than I thought. Uh, here we see him raising his staff, and he continually did it. Well, as the 2000 uh, California campaign, gubernatorial, uh, uh, as the 2003 California recall and gubernatorial elections looked like a flashback to the 1960s, an actor with seemingly no political experience was trying to win a major office. And columnists breezily compared Arnold Schwarzenegger to George Murphy and Ronald Reagan. But such comparisons were inaccurate. Reagan and Murphy spent over 20 years in the political trenches before they ran for government office. They were well known by conservatives in California and throughout the country. Arnold, as he liked to be called, was a relative newcomer and other than campaigning for George H.W. Bush in 1988 and 92, he had no formal ties to the Republican Party. And if history was any guide, he should have lost that special election to either Tom McClintock or Cruz Bustamante. But Schwarzenegger defied history and in so doing elevated the last form of politics, celebrity politics, to new heights. What he did was to show that the power of celebrity was so great that a movie star could be elected to high office without the benefit of an established party network or a precise ideological message. And Schwarzenegger's story revealed how the explosion of 24-7 entertainment media has transformed American politics. Now, long before Arnold Schwarzenegger, Schwarzenegger America, uh, politicians had appeared on TV. For those of you old enough to remember the Jack Parr show, John Kennedy and Richard Nixon appeared on it in 1960. We know Clinton appeared on Arsenio Hall playing saxophone. And yet these occasional appearances were peripheral 
to their campaign. The real work was talking with reporters and serious news shows. But Schwarzenegger differed in his innovative use of celebrity and media. He understood that these seemingly lightweight, uh, lightweight venues like Access Hollywood, Entertainment Tonight, offered new ways of engaging and mobilizing voters, particularly the 50% who don't vote. And during his gubernatorial run, he shunned traditional news outlets and placed entertainment shows at the center of his campaign. He announced his candidacy on The Tonight Show. He publicized it on Oprah. He made speeches from uh, using lines from his movies, like telling politicians who were not doing their job that they would be told, hasta la vista, baby, <laughs> calling them girly men. And instead of talking policy to the New York Times, the LA Times, the Wall Street Journal, he preferred television interviews with Larry King, Jay Leno, and Sean Hannity. Well, celebrity and stunts got Schwarzenegger elected, but it didn't ensure he would be an effective leader. And his campaign and subsequent years in office point to the limitations of turning politics into entertainment without offering voters the complex but perhaps boring policy statements that actually would allow them to select the most capable candidate. In the end, Schwarzenegger's story highlights the difference between a celebrity who knows how to run for office and a politician who knows how to govern in office. And as Barack Obama has showed in 2008 and John Kennedy before him, politicians who become celebrities have a better chance of governing effectively than celebrities who become politicians. Well, my hope is that today's talk will get people thinking about the relationship between Hollywood and politics in a more serious way. One may not like the politics of the movie stars I profiled today, but we need to admire their political commitment. These were people who could have very easily basked in their fame and in their wealth, but instead they worked as hard at their politics as they did at their screen careers. They spoke out on behalf of causes that were both popular and unpopular, regardless of the consequences. And to this extent, they fit the founding fathers' model of citizen statesmen, and that they had a vision of the world they wanted to see, and they were willing to work to usher in that change. And for that, they deserve our respect. If every citizen was as politically active as these people were, the United States would be a far better place. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Steve. That was terrific. And uh, I just want you all to know that if you are under the illusion that you know everything that's in this book and don't need to buy it, it's not true. Their bookstore has a table downstairs, and Steve is going to be happy to sign any copies that you purchase. And my agent gets 10%. <laughs> so, um, Steve, in the, in the book, in the marketing for the book, in all the reviews of the book, one thing is always said, which is that the premise of this book is that conventional wisdom is wrong that Hollywood is not the bastion of lefties, that in fact there are people on the right who are really, really important, and one could argue that even more effective than on the left. So my question is, where did this idea, the conventional wisdom, that Hollywood is the left, where did that come from if it's so wrong and you're able to demolish it? What's the origin of it? Has it always been like that? Oh, well, it hasn't always been like that because Hollywood wasn't political to the 1930s. Why did it work? I think it has to do with the problem, that what I call the American problem of quantity and quality. That we look at um, the, the sheer numbers of movie stars who are politically active are overwhelmingly on the left. And the left, I, I cut my talk a little short, I'm starting to run a little over. 
But the left, I don't want to denigrate the left. The left has been more publicly visible. If you take a look at what the left in general has, has preferred not to run for high office. Instead, they prefer to focus on issues, which means they're always in the public eye. You can start with anti-Nazism and anti-fascism in the 1930s. And I want to point out that that drew a lot of attention because we have this idea of the myth of the good war. If you watch enough Tom Hanks, you begin to believe it. It is a myth. In 1930, November 1936, 95% of Americans were opposed to any American intervention in Europe. And as late as July 1941, two years after the war, 79% of Americans, according to Gallup, wanted nothing to do with it. It was the movie stars speaking out. One of the reasons for UAC was to silence the power of liberal Hollywood because it drew so much attention. You had movie stars engaged in the civil rights movement at a time in the 50s and 60s when no one wanted to touch it. You had movie stars engaged in the anti-war movements in Vietnam, in the anti-war movements surrounding Iraq, and in a whole bunch of social justice movements. So it appears as though movie stars have been out there, which they have been. But again, I, I would say, if that's the way you look at it, which is the way most, how many journalism majors do we have here? All right, well, my friend Cheryl Gould, who was the highest, many years the highest ranking woman, in network news producing a nightly news we talked about, <clears throat> came out to the, that place across town in which she was not invited back because she told all the journalism students to stop majoring in journalism and major in history. Because you'll learn how to write later on, but what you won't learn is the context. Most reporters don't do the homework, they don't see the big picture. So as far as it looks from the 1930s to today, the left speaks out much more than the right. But if you ask, again, if you go to the fundamental premise that I have, that there are two foundational moments. The New Deal, creating a social safety net, what we would call social democracy, and the attempt, as we've seen in this election, the past election, to eliminate that, to get rid of that. To me, those are foundational moments that go beyond anything the Hollywood left has been talking about. And it's Republicans who have Hollywood Republicans who have led the way. Every talk that I've been at where you have been in the audience, you have always asked the question afterward, so what? Right. So what? <laughs> well, I don't have to get tenure, so I didn't have to write the book for that. <laughs> so what? It goes back to what I said at the very beginning which is I really, I think we have a crisis in this country that we don't admit. If many of you remember the last two elections ago in Venezuela, when uh, uh, Hugo Chavez had a uh, series of constitutional changes, and Chavez, very popular in Venezuela, very popular, but these constitutional changes would have given him sort of near dictatorial power. And the picture, and I can't remember, it was the LA Times or the New York Times, but it showed people lined up at six in the morning and you could see it was cold and foggy. And they were standing on these huge lines waiting for hours to go in to vote. They had well over an 80% vote on this amendment to turn it down because they were afraid, even with the man they liked. Something is wrong when the leading nation in the world has only 50% of its citizens voting. And so to me, the so what is, if I can begin to do two things, one in, a, in the most partisan era I've lived through, show, and look, my politics are definitely on the left, but I did something here I've never done before, which is I really have tried to write a post-partisan book. If you read through this book, you will, I think, find an incredibly even-handed treatment of Republicans and Democrats. I wanted to show what could Republicans and Democrats learn from each other, because I'll tell you this, Democrats could learn a lot in terms of all the media innovations in politics have been done by the Republicans first, not by the Democrats. So that's one of the so ones. That actually, if we cut out the partisan bickering, there's a lot we can learn from one another. And the second is, I was thinking, if people read this book, maybe, you know, we're not talking huge numbers, but every one of us does what we can. If people read this book and they begin to say, oh, I begin to see what some of these issues are about. This is explained in a very clear way. 
maybe that would get them to vote in the election. Maybe that would get them to actually pay more attention. It's the same thing the re in the question I always get asked by reporters in the media is, do movie stars, do, does the endorsement of a movie star really sway the electorate? And my answer is no, because it means you're an idiot <laughs> if you vote. And the polls that come out ask consistently ask the wrong question. They ask, in 2008, the question asked was asked, uh, does Oprah's endorsement, I went on the Today Show, and they pulled out the statistics, you know, Larry, I forget his last name, uh, said to me, you know, Oprah's endorsement in the latest Gallup poll, when voters were asked, will Oprah's endorsement make you vote for Obama? Only 3% said yes. And I said, but Larry, if you look at another poll that asked the question, is Oprah's endorsement more likely to make you pay attention to Barack Obama? The figure was 38%. And that's part of the so of the book. If I can get you to read something about American politics, if I can get you to understand some of these issues in a clear way, then maybe I can help increase the vote. And I'm not saying I'm going to increase it by hundreds of thousands. I don't even know tens of thousands. But every one of us, if every one of us did something to further the cause of democracy, we would have a transformed world. We may have a moment to come back to Oprah and endorsements, but I want to I want to uh, move to something that you do in the epilogue to the book. Um, you quote Tom Hayden, uh, Jane Fonda's husband, for a chunk of the, the story you're telling. And he is wrestling with the question, maybe you put it to him, are celebrity politics good or bad for democracy? Let me just read a piece of what he said. Um, uh, he, his answer was, well, there's bad and there's good. So some of the bad, by playing to celebrity, undermine democracy by turning citizens into fans. You turn critical thinking into adoration. You elevate stars to a kind of papal role. And then as you paraphrase, it undermines a core principle of mass democracy. The people, not one figure, should decide the nation's path. And then on the other hand, he said, stars draw attention to issues, raise a lot of money, and get media attention, and create a huge motivation for young people to get involved when the celebrities are gone. So where are you on this? Good, bad, both, neither? Well, I think it's, um, it's I think, the hardest question to answer. And I think it comes down to your worldview. Are you an optimist or are you a pessimist? I'm someone where there's always water in the glass, and I'm married to someone where what water, what glass? <laughs> so between the two of us, we kind of have a balanced view. But what Hayden is really saying is true, that what celebrities do is they, they get people who would not normally pay attention to political issues. And in this case, he was talking about their California campaign when they turned the Brat Pack, the old Brat Pack, into activists who created a group called Network of Young Movie Stars who became politically engaged. And they, in turn, spread out and attracted people from their fame, particularly young Americans. They brought an enormous amount of attention. They got a tremendous amount of the youth vote out. But on the other side, it's well, what does it say if your movement is being led by a movie star? All right, have you abandoned critical thinking? Are you thinking through the issues? Or are you just voting in the way a star has to tell you. So in other words, part of it is, does it in fact diminish the quality of democracy? Um, are we better off, this is a question I was just talking about with my uh, freshman inquiry seminar today. Would we be better off not trying to get the 50% who don't vote to vote? Because maybe they shouldn't be voting. Maybe they're not bright enough, engaged enough. And if a movie star motivates them, they're going to vote for the wrong reasons. I think it comes down again, and I may be naive, I fully recognize that. It's about, and this is something we argued in graduate school about the very making of the Constitution. If you read Gordon Wood, the Creation of the American Republic, the founding fathers battled with the very idea of do we limit democracy? Because certain people are not intelligent enough 
to vote. And my feeling is, in a democracy, you have to trust the demos. You have to trust the people. And I would rather have 80% voting. And if it takes movie stars to get them to vote, I'll take the chance that there could be a downside as well. But I still believe the more people that vote, the greater chance of a real democracy we have. You make a troubling point, though. Uh, uh, you say, we are on the threshold of a new political landscape in which movie stars and celebrities will have even more influence, and politicians will have to become entertainers if they wish to reach a broader electorate. To the risks of trivialization, of being driven by markets and ratings, uh, would strike me as something that you'd be concerned about. Yeah, but I don't think it's actually going to play out in quite that way. I think what happens, you know, Ronald Reagan once said, I don't know how, I don't understand how anyone can be a politician without being an actor. Um, I think what has to happen is that politicians have to become more media savvy, that they're going to have to learn how to communicate better. And one of the arguments I have in, in my book that I cut out here because of time is one of the reasons I think Republicans and the Hollywood right have been so successful is they have always understood the storyline better than Democrats, that you need to tell a story. And the Republican storyline from Louis B. Mayer to George Murphy to Ronald Reagan to uh, Charlton Heston to Arnold Schwarzenegger has been America is the greatest nation in the world. What more do you need to know? And while Republicans have consistently talked about American triumphalism, Democrats have talked about our problems. It's not very entertaining to talk about our problems. So yes, I think in the media age, there's pressure. We saw after the last election, 2008, I think it was five of the seven Republican candidates got their own shows on Fox, on Fox News. And that was one of the things I was trying to address, is what happens, you know, and now Mike Huckabee, if you saw him on Jon Stewart last night, it's clear he's not going to run anymore unless he's going to lose a lot of weight. All the weight he took <laughs> off to run, he's put back on, and he's very friendly, and, he's, and he is wrapping his politics in entertaining forms. And there's a danger there. I, I understand that. But again, it's that kind of line. If you prompt people, if you use entertainment to get them to pay attention, will they actually pay attention to the issues, or will they only pay attention to the entertainment? I don't really know the answer, so I'm taking a Kierkegaardian leap of faith. And simply because I don't know, I just don't know, I still want to believe in the best instincts of Americans in a democracy. In a couple of minutes, uh, we're going to open to questions from the room. But let me just uh, turn a bit from tracking the ideas in the book to talking about the writing of the book. Okay. So. Who was the hardest interview to get? Warren Beatty. And what was that like? Well, my wife is a TV movie producer. So half our friends are academics, half our friends are in the TV and feature world. And so I have a lot of mutual friends. And uh, they all call them, you know, including Ariana Huffington and others, with my friend Amy Davis, who is this producer on Love, Love Story. Um, and they all said, you can trust this guy. He's going to do an honest interview. He's not out to get you. And uh, I started calling. And I got his assistant, Michael. And I kept calling for over a year. And finally, I was so disgusted. I called Michael. I said, look, my proposal's going in. And if Warren isn't going to stand for an interview, I'm going to switch it and get another character in there. I, I can't keep doing this. And I said, so tell him I need, uh, if I don't talk to him by the end of the week, not in the book. I got a phone call at 1 o'clock the next day. Hi, Steve. It's Warren. <laughs> Can you come over now? And I showed up at 2 o'clock. And at a quarter to 1 in the morning, I said, Warren, I have to go home. I'm going to sleep. Uh, and it was exactly what everyone told me. They said, if Warren agrees to talk to you, it will be a full court seduction scene. <laughs> now, I will tell you this. Here's the difference between USC academic world in Hollywood. Uh, my friends who know him in, in the industry said, Warren Beatty's the smartest person I know. And several people said that. 
Well, they're not hanging out with USC professors. Because Warren Beatty is a smart man. He is a very smart man, but he is not even close to the smartest man I know. He was, and the other thing that was interesting is I taped all my interviews and he refused to be taped. And I said, why won't you let me do it? Well, I don't want to be taped. Why? I don't, you know, I'm there already you now. He's not going to tell me now. Why? This went on for five minutes. I said, Warren, well, there's going to be no interview until you tell me why. And he said, well, I don't want to sound, you know, uh, uh, I said, I promise you, I'll filter that out. I'm not here to make you look bad. The second hardest interview was Tom Hayden, who said, I'm married to Jane. Mar Jane and I were married. We have a child together. I'm not going to talk to you about her. And one of the things I said to everyone I interviewed up front um, is that no gossip, no salacious stuff. I don't want to know anything about your sex life, your private life, other than your politics. And if we, if I ask you anything inappropriate, end the interview right there. Uh, and it took me two years to get Tom to agree to let me interview. I knew Warren Beatty first from the political time when he was working for Gary <coughs> Park in the primaries and I was on the other side, and then knew him uh, in my time at Disney. And every time, from time to time, he would call for one reason or another. And every time, he would say at the beginning of the call, hello, this is Warren Beatty, the movie star. <laughs> I'd love. So if he had not participated, what was your backup list? Who did not get into this book you would have loved to have done? Well, they were the same time period, but I really would have liked to have done uh, Ruby D and Ozzie Davis. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people, you know, I got slammed in a number of why didn't you do this person or that person? It's a 500-page book. I mean, how many pages are any of you going to read? Let alone, how many pages am I going to write? Um, you know, there were people like Barbara Streisand, certainly John Wayne. Um, I could have done Sidney Poitier, but he was a, for Warren Beatty's period, he was the guy. I, I'm not sure who I would take it, because what I really, the book is structured, it goes left, right, left, right across the 20th century. And so I, I, I would have had, I probably would have gone for Robert Redford. That's who I think that would have been my next choice. Questions from the audience? Yes, sir. I, I have two questions for you. One is I was struck by, conspicuously by your use of mayor in the book when he isn't necessarily a star, per se, and his introduction of political campaigning and upending up in Sinclair parallels everything that we've just gone through over the past week, including making studio employees have to pay to support the Republican Party or make it included off the set. Um, but I, I was curious as to why you chose to include him in this book when it wasn't necessarily yeah. a star. Yeah, it is the one, uh, it is the only non-movie star in the book, and it's a very simple reason. There's no conservative stars in Providence in the 1920s. And I even wrote uh, Kevin Brownlow, who, for those of us who've ever worked in the silent theory, is the god of the silent theory. He's the man who knows everything. And I said, Kevin, if I overlook someone, is there anyone here? Um, the most conservative movie star of that period, but her, she didn't do her politics until later on, was Mary Pickford. Mary Pickford was an admirer of Benito Mussolini, an admirer of Adolf Hitler, um, and later on became very active, uh, well, always active, but very active in the Republican Party during the 50s and 60s. Uh, but Mayor, <clears throat> Both because there was no movie star and because once I began looking into it, he was such a central figure. He is a major political heavyweight. He is the first heavyweight in Hollywood, period, left or right. And so I thought in the absence of a movie star, this guy is so important. And he's laying the groundwork for a lot of the conservative ideology. And he turned, not only does he turn MGM into a publicity win for the Republican Party, but MGM becomes the political salon in Hollywood for the conservative movement. And his uh, secretary, Ida Koberman, who was really his political mentor, she had worked for Hoover, and Hoover connected uh, the two of them together. And she taught Mayer how power politics works, and who do you need to know, and how do you need to work. And she ran a political salon in the studio that she brought all the young <coughs> stars together, the Robert Montgomery's, the Robert Taylor's, the George Murphys, 
and older stars like Adolf Manchu. And every few weeks, they, she would bring in a politician or an academic on the right who would lecture the stars on what's going on and politically talk about the New Deal and the devil that, uh, that uh, FDR was. And also, when you take a look in the 1940s, when you have the conservative, a conservative front uh, kind of as counterpoint to the popular front on the left, the people who formed the Motion Picture Association for the Preservation of American Democracy, which is the group that invites HUAC to come to Hollywood, uh, something like 95% all come out of MGM and are all, in a sense, proteges of mayor. Let me interrupt just because I want to get some more questions. How about a student? I have some students. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, you. Uh, just today in class we were talking about celebrity diplomacy and how it has become a very important tool within the politics, not only in the U.S., but also around the world and in you know, global issues too. Um, what, would you, what would you say about this concern of celebrities being not the, the proper messengers of, of a political issue, but just being part of the show? Um, do you think this is really um, like a bit of a rear for people to get involved, people that might not be involved in <coughs> politics before? Do you think celebrity diplomacy could get them to get to know at least the issues, not get involved, but at least know about them? Yeah, it's a good question. And here's what I would say. It goes back, um, I went through the Hollywood Democratic and the Hollywood Republican Committee records. And starting in the late 20s and 30s, they were both sending out, uh, the 30s really is what it's called. Uh, both sides were sending out movie stars on the road with the politician. It's a, it's a parallel way of answering the question. And what both sides were writing back when they would send out a star with either congressional candidate, gubernatorial candidate, Senate candidate on the road into small cities, into large cities, what consistently came back is, if our candidate had just come here to speak, he would have drawn about 2,000 people. But because Humphrey Bogart showed up, because Adolf Manchu showed up, we had 15,000 people who showed. Now, mind you, many of those people left after the movie star introduced them, but you still had more than half who remained. And those who remained listened to what the politician had to say. I would say it's the same thing about the sort of celebrity causes here, that a celebrity, Angelina Jolie, traveling to anywhere she's traveling, is going to get a X factor, X by five, four, five, six, seven, ten, people showing up who never would have showed up. Now, we know a lot of them are going to show up just to see a movie star, a very attractive movie star. And a number of them will leave if she leaves. But the point is, a number of people who would not have paid attention to that issue will show up at that demonstration, at that meeting, at that gathering. And they'll sit and they'll listen. And of those people who sit and listen, a number of them are going to become politicized. <coughs> or at the very least, awakened. And that's what I mean by politicized. That you actually are awakened to what's going on around you. And I don't see how that can be bad. I, I saw some other student hands. Yeah. I, I'm actually in history 40s. That was not popular in this country. When you spoke out on behalf of civil rights in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, this is another thing that got Edward G. Robinson in 
trouble as he was speaking out, uh, sending telegrams to Truman and speaking out on racial discrimination in the South. When you're speaking out on that in the 50s and 60s, when you're leading the anti-war movement, and remember it's not until 1968 that public opinion is finally even at 40 for the war, 40 opposed to the war, 20 neutral. So speaking out got in trouble. When you're Tom, uh, 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 Susan Sarandon and Tim Robbins speaking out against the war in Iraq and then discovering that your invitation to speak at the Baseball Hall of Fame is pulled, they are moving to change the status quo. How much they actually do on their own is debatable. But I would say the Hollywood left has been more, has tried to change the status quo. And to get back to Provost Garrett's point, if you look at American politics, American politics is set up, we are set up as a conservative, relatively speaking, it is a conservative democracy where it's hard to change things because the founding fathers fear the power of the demos, of the people. They fear that you could get an uneducated population riled up by things like movie stars who would get them attracted to issues that they don't really know. And so if you look at American history, you've got the 18th, what are the periods of major reform? 1830s, the Civil War, the Progressive Era, the 1930s, the 1960s. That's about it. Yes. Well, throughout everything you've said so far this, this uh, evening, uh, one thing you really haven't mentioned is that the Hollywood left, you know, the, the, the equation between the Hollywood left and essentially secular Jews in this country, that, that, that the politics in this town have pretty much been set by what is a, a fairly common, an overwhelming um, um, political view of most Jews in this country. It's, uh, they are liberal on so, in terms of social causes. And, uh, it, but that also, I mean, Louis B. Merritt may have been, because of his politics, may have been viewed by the Republican establishment as being like an honorary Protestant, but for which the is most, what he wanted. Yeah, but for the most part, um, the the demonization of the left by the right, it, as it pertains to Hollywood, was tied very closely to the view of Jews as being, you know, agents of Bolshevism. That they brought these that they brought these things to this country, and that Jews were, ne were never seen as being something, as being part of the mainstream of this country, and that. Um, We've kind of come out of that, even though there's still probably a little bit. So, I can ask you, what's the question? Well, it's not really a question, but I mean, but you, you just kind well, of, you, you just kind of. Only because we're running out of time. Started around let's, it. Let's leave it there for a second. Do you want to comment on that? The only thing I would say, just remember, the studio heads were all Jews, and with the exception of the uh, Warner Brothers in the 1930s, that temporarily went over to the Democrats, they went back to the Republican Party. So, you know, the ones running the studios were conservative Jews. The ones that they were employing were liberal Jews. We have time for one more question. Yes, sir. I wanted to ask about the role of Dor Sherry in, in limiting Louis B. Meyer's power and shifting the ideology from right wing to, to towards the left and opening up MGM in particular for black stars. Yeah. Uh, Mayor, you know, believed that MGM was his personal kingdom. Uh, but in the late 40s, as, as uh, attendance at all movies began to decline rapidly, uh, Mayer got removed and he was replaced, uh, and what really hurt him is he was replaced by one of the main Democratic leaders in Hollywood, Dory Sherry. And Dory Sherry believed that Mayer's old treacly formulas were outdated, and that he wanted to bring Hollywood and particularly MGM back to social issue films. And that's what he did. He brought in he did uh, a whole range of films dealing with anti-Semitism, films dealing with race, also trying to have more black stars above the line. What he didn't do was get black workers below the line. But he tried to open up uh, MGM Studios, and he basically changed it 180 degrees. And in fact, you're right. He made it possible for more African-American actors to work in his studio. He was not popular with Hollywood. So please join me in thanking Steve Ross and Marty.
Writers Series, we're doing something special in honor of our authors. There is a program at our libraries called Shelf Life, which allows you to donate money to the libraries and restore some of the books in the library that are old, that need restoration, that need us to preserve them so that we have that knowledge forever. And so for each of our Distinguished Writers Series, I have restored a book in the library in honor of the professor in the writer's series. And Steve, for your book, and it has a little box, so it's a present you can't take home, but you can visit it in the library anytime you want to, and I know you're in the library. We have restored, it's a, it's a strange little tract that came out in 1924. It's by Pearly Poor Sheehan, who was a script, a script writer and a producer in that era. And it's called Hollywood as a World Center. It was published by something called Hollywood Citizen Press, and it's a strange little compilation of boosterism about Hollywood as the new Jerusalem, about thinking about this as a place that is going to change the world because of its existence. And it will always be in the library and help us remember this evening, and I want to thank both of you for being a special part of this inaugural writer series. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to add before we leave the students here, undergrads and grads, I want to tell you, I used to write labor history. When I wrote labor history, I got invited to places like Rochester and Youngstown, Ohio. When you write about Hollywood, Paris, Sydney, <laughs> everywhere around the country. So uh, there you go. <laughs> Thank you.